John, Burks, Gillespie. We know him as Dizzy Gillespie. Born in a little town, Choctaw, I think it's called, South Carolina. And uh, he grew up in a musical home. His father was a band leader. So there were instruments laying around. And uh, young John decided he'd try the trombone. Yeah, he tried that for a while. He tried this for a while, he tried that. But somewhere along the line, I think he must have heard Louis Armstrong or somebody and decided, you know what? I like this whole trumpet thing. And that was it. He became a trumpet player. I uh, went up to uh, North Carolina to uh, one of the uh, private schools for uh, gifted artistic kids. Uh, I'm sure it was one of those segregated schools in those days. And uh, that lasted for a while. But uh, once again, he got a little uh, antsy and decided to go on the road, I think, with a vaudeville group touring and doing shows and picking up his, uh, how shall I say this, uh, artistic personality, the sense of uh, comedy and, uh, and, and, and telling jokes and uh, just kind of being a, a, a funny guy to be around. Um, and he kept that with him for the rest of his life. Uh, his personality, his manner of speech, and sometimes his manner of dress. Um, his life was like everybody else's life as a musician uh, in those years, born in 1917. Uh, by uh, the 30s, you're in the middle of the swing era, and uh, he's a swing musician like everybody else. He's playing in big bands, um, Teddy Hill's big band, and um, uh, Earl Hines' big band, uh, Cab Calloway's big band, and, uh, and Biddy Eckstein's band. I think he probably met uh, Charlie Parker in uh, Cab Calloway's band. And then again, uh, they reunited in, uh, in uh, Biddy Eckstein's band. And um, so that partnership that became the whole bebop uh, leadership uh, came through the big band era, and as, as Dizzy likes to say, people always characterize bebop as being this revolutionary thing that came from over there somewhere, out of space or whatever, and he's like, no, 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 no. He said it was just a natural outgrowth of swing. All of us were swing musicians. And when the big bands began to dissipate, disappear, we ended up playing in smaller combos and we had all been working on our technique and mu advanced musical concepts and eventually it evolved into what you know, a bebop. And I mean, to be honest with you, he feels that some of the very first uh, bebop recordings were big band recordings, particularly in uh, the Heinz band uh, and later in uh, Eckstein band. So, um, he feels that uh, bebop was kind of an evolution, not a revolution. Um, nonetheless, he was at Minton's and all those uh, great jam sessions there, and he was hanging with all the cats, whether it's Mike Roach or Oscar Pettiford, the great bass player, or Sonny Rollins or Charlie Parker or Bud Powell or any number of cats that were on the scene at that time. Uh, they're collaborating, they learn from each other, and this music is evolving into something quite special, and Dizzy is the man. Now Dizzy was multi-talented. He was a singer, a band leader, composer, arranger, and he was also uh, an innovator, particularly on the trumpet. No one played that trumpet like that. Dizzy had a fiery technique that simply was new to the scene. And it would be many years before anyone could duplicate it. You know, there was Miles Davis and there was Roy Elridge and there was this guy and that guy, but no one was trying to be Dizzy for another 20, 30 years until this young guy, John Fattis, showed up. He had the same kind of range and facility of a Dizzy Gillespie so he could do Dizzy-ish things. But that wasn't what Brownie was doing, or it wasn't what Lee Morgan was doing, it wasn't what Miles was doing, and, and no one was trying to be Dizzy because Dizzy was alone. You know, Dizzy likes to tell this uh, uh, story. You know, he was married to one woman. He married this dancer he met uh, around the time he was playing with the Heinz Band, 
and uh, she kind of helped guide his career, and he got married, and they stayed married right, right up until his death. Uh, and um, uh, he loved her, you know, and she loved him. Uh, they never had any kids, but, you know, they, they had each other. And uh, Miles tells the story that uh, the main reason he hung out with Dizzy is so when he went to Dizzy's house, he could eat some of Lorraine's food because she could really cook. Well, I got that too. Uh, musicians uh, love to eat, and sometimes food is scarce for musicians. And when you got somebody that can really cook, you want to be right there. So this is what was going on with the collaboration with Miles and Dizzy. And Dizzy was like, you ain't eating none of my uh, wife's food. So you sit down at this piano and let me show you some harmony. And of course, as Dizzy was a composer, of things like Grooving Heart and Salt Peanuts and uh, Manteca and so many other great tunes, Night in Tunisia, uh, first tune with a syncopated bass line. Um, uh, Miles became a great composer in his right, and we'll talk about that in a later episode. But Desi affected musicians not just uh, with his spirit and his improvisations, but with his awesome trumpet playing, and also with his sense of adventurous composition and arranging. And uh, that's something that we really uh, need not to take our eyes off. He was also a kind and generous man. Not, peop not many people know that uh, in the later years of his life, he lived in uh, Inglewood, New Jersey. And of course, that is where he died of uh, pancreatic cancer, somewhere around 93 or so. But um, one of the things he did uh, is he set up a uh, section of the hospital that provided free medical care to working musicians. Because he knew not all musicians uh, had the kind of income and stability he did and where do we suffer as musicians? Healthcare. He'd seen many of his friends die at a early age for lack of proper health care. And so one of the things that Dizzy put his money into was to make sure that musicians who were not as lucky as he had access to health care, at least in that metropolitan New York area, through the hospital there in uh, uh, Teaneck and in Inglewood, uh, New Jersey areas. Um, Dizzy helped solidify uh, the marriage between jazz and Afro-Cuban music because when he started his big band, he had two rumboleros, these Cuban rumba drummers uh, in his band. So he started this marriage between Afro-Cuban music and jazz and even did more when he visited Cuba and got involved with people like Paquito and Sandoval, uh, et cetera, uh, in order to create this marriage between his bebop legacy and the Afro-Cuban legacy, which uh, produced groups like Eric Hire and um, all of the groups that uh, uh, Chuchu Valdez was able to create um, through his association with Dizzy Gillespie and the later uh, generation of jazz musicians, including uh, Roy Hargrove. So uh, Dizzy's influence in this music is unbelievable. Going back to the birthday party that uh, he had for his wife, it was at that birthday party where things got a little bit uh, rambunctious that somebody knocked his trumpet down. And when he picked it up, the bell was bent. Well, he still had to play. It's a birthday party. You got to play for your wife. And he did. And uh, he liked the way it sounded. He didn't care the way it looked. It sounded cool to him. And he liked it. So guess what? From that point on, he kept a trumpet with a big bell. As a matter of fact, manufacturers started making trumpets with big bells. I remember when the entire Fam U Marching Band trumpet section, all 33 of them had Dizzy Gillespie style trumpets to help project that sound up into the stands. So Dizzy was an innovator, not just on the stage, but off the stage as well in terms of instrument design with his bent bell 
trumpet. What are we going to say about a guy who brought us horn rim glasses and goatees and berets and bebop and extraordinary range and technique on the trumpet and Afro-Cuban music and expanded harmonic, melodic marriages and just compositions and arranging and stylistic things, our social culture things. What are we going to do? We're going to look at that guy and we're going to say, thank you, Tiz Gillespie. We're going to say, dear Diz, we love you for what you did for us. Thank you. <laughs>